an important session because this is an oration. This oration is dedicated to Dr. Mun Munichudappa C. Sir. And we all need not talk about Dr. Muni Munichudappa Sir because we know he is one of the first diabetologists of Karnataka. He has been credited to be the first person to introduce the super specialty concept in diabetes care at Karnataka State. He is our Bhishma Pitama of diabetes care, holding medical qualifications from India, Canada, and USA. He has worked on several research projects and published newer findings related to diabetes, held several positions in many professional bodies such as API, IMA, RSSDI, and Diabetes Club. In his honor, Dr. C. Munichudapa oration has been established. And to present this oration, we have with us Dr. Anil Kumar, sir. And to chair this session, I call upon two senior most here, Dr. Sidney De Souza and Dr. Ravi Kumar Vyas. While Dr. Anil Kumar sir is being honored, it is my privilege to read his life story. He is currently the professor and head department of diabetes and endocrinology at Karnataka Institute of Endocrinology and Research, Bangalore. He has more than 35 years of experience in clinical practice. He completed his MBBS in 1987, MD internal medicine in 1998. He has completed WHO fellowship in diabetology at MV Diabetes Hospital, Chennai and has been awarded fellowship by Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, UK, fellowship of Indian College of Physicians, fellowship of Research Society of Diabetes of India, and he has also received USV RSSDA award for best innovation in diabetes care in challenging situations in 2021. He has been scope certified in obesity management by World Obesity Federation, and he has been felicitated at 86 All India Kannada Sahitya Sammelana at Haveri. He has, always, he has also been past chairman, RSSDA Karnataka chapter 2017 and 18, past secretary, RSSDA Chap Karnataka chapter, president for Diabetes Club, and is also the governing council member, RSSDA 2008, 2009, and 2011 and 12. He is also a scientific committee member of Epicon 2018 Bangalore and national RSSDA 2014. He has delivered presidency oration at KRSSDA 2018 Mysore, delivered Diacon annual oration 2020 at Bijapur, and has delivered Dr. Brasava Rajavendra memorial oration at Manipal Capicon 2023. He is a co-guide for NIMHANS and ICMR project. He is also the principal investigator for RGHS Modi project. He has 36 original research publications at national and international journals, and 11 papers presented at national conferences, delivered more than 160 seminars in national, state, and various CVME programs. So dedicating this talk and delivering Muni Sudapa oration is Dr. Anil Kumar. I think you all know about this great man, Dr. C. Munichudappa. Yeah. I request all the youngsters, young doctors, to come to the hall because I am speaking on diabetes in young. So they are the ones I think they will manage uh, diabetes in young in future. So I have some interesting uh, studies of uh, interesting cases. Uh, so uh, as already Dr. Sureka had already explained about the achievements of Dr. Munichudappa. Dr. Munichudappa 
is the father of diabetology in Karnataka. He was the first diabetologist in Karnataka. And he is known as the Bhishma Pitamaha of diabetology in Karnataka. I think without him, diabetology would not have started so early in Karnataka. So before, of course, when we were uh, probably students, whenever diabetes means, they used to say Dr. Muni Chudapa. So that we all know. And because of that, so many youngsters are practicing diabetology now in Karnataka and flourishing well. Now I am talking on precision in clinical care of diabetes in young. Of course, we had a lot of discussion on evidence-based medicine, going to precision medicine. Now I'm talking on precision medicine. Of course, I don't have any bias, no pharmaceutical bias in this talk. So I am happy to present this prestigious Dr. Munichudappa oration. I will try my best to make this oration clinically interesting. I request all the delegates to think as if they are in their diabetic clinic treating young diabetes persons. So I think uh, <clears throat> when I was a secretary, most of the audience, they were complaining that orations were not interesting. So I thought it should be clinically interesting. So I tried my level best to make this clinically interesting. I want to present four cases or four diabetes, uh, young diabetes patients referred to me in our institute. This patient, aged 22 years, BMI 28.5, diabetes duration one year, family history positive. She was on regular insulin, of course, basal uh, regular insulin, 30 in the morning, 30 in the afternoon, and premix 30. HPA1C 11%, FPG 292, PPG 447, treated as type 1 diabetes. Of course, when we see a young patient like this, definitely we have to treat as type 1 diabetes. And again, one more patient aged 15 years, again, family history positive, BMI very low, 15, again treated as type 1 diabetes. HbA1c was 13.8%. And again, this patient aged 20 years with BMI 19.49 and HbA1c 16.5%, again treated as type 1 diabetes. And this is a female patient aged 27 years, BMI 20, HbA1c 8.5%, again treated as type 1 diabetes. All these patients treated as type 1 diabetes referred to our institute. And now, when we treat or examine a diabetes in young, I think we have to address these questions. What's the type of diabetes we are treating? Which type is more aggressive? Whether remission is possible in young diabetics? This is the era of remission. I don't want to use the term reversal whether antibody tests to be done in all young diabetics, how to manage diabetes in young, what, which are the rare types of diabetes in young. Once diagnosis is made, is there a possibility to change the diagnosis subsequently after one year or two years? Finally, what is the flow chart for the diagnosis of diabetes in young? So what's the type of diabetes? So to decide about the type of diabetes, you should have the clinical features, age. Anger the age, more in favor of type 1 diabetes. BMI, leaner, less BMI, more in favor of type 1. Overweight and obesity, again, more in favor of type 2. Family history, family history is positive, more in favor of type 2 diabetes. Negative, more in favor of type 1 diabetes. History of ketoacidosis. If the patient comes with ketoacidosis, I think we have to think type 1 diabetes. Of course, very rarely some patients type 2 also have ketoacidosis. And then fasting and stimulated C-peptide levels, if they are very low, you should say it is type 1 diabetes. If it is on the higher side, it is type 2 diabetes. And antibodies, I think antibodies will not decide about the diagnosis. It will just add on to your diagnosis. And then presence of markers of insulin resistance. If insulin resistance or markers are there, definitely it is type 2 diabetes. And we did a study in our institute, just uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sureka is here. So I decided to start this study and I was discussing with her and I told her there may be many studies in literature. So when we searched in the literature, we could not get much studies. That is utility, utility of fasting C-peptide levels in the classification of young diabetics between 15 and 35 years. So here we studied 426 subjects with the age of onset between 15 and 35 over a period of five years. You can see here, we took three points, that is fasting C-peptide less than 0.6 type 1 diabetes, 0.6 to 1.5 type 1 or type 2 diabetes, 
more than 1.5 type 2 diabetes. By taking these criteria, we analyzed our patients. The results were 15 to 35 years, type 1 was only 2.8%, type 1 or type 2 was 11.5%, and type 2 was 85.7%. But 15 to 20 years, younger the age, type 1 was more, 5.5, and type 1 or type 2 was 28%, and about 67% is type 2. So here, type 1, type 2, and uh, between less than 0.6, more than 1.5, no problem. But between 0.6 to 1.5, again, we have to see the age, BMI, family history, diabetic ketoacidosis, all those things we should see and then decide about whether it is type 1 or type 2. This is the algorithm we have used for the analysis in our study. Which type of diabetes is more aggressive? That also we should remember, because in young, type 1 and early onset type 2 diabetes, which is more aggressive. In this study by Maria et al., they showed that the mortality, especially cardiovascular deaths, are more in early onset type 2 diabetes when compared to type 1 diabetes. And again, in one more study by uh, Healer et al., they studied about 7,844 patients, and they showed that the microalbuminuria or microvascular complications was two times more in early onset type 2 when compared to type 1 diabetes. And cardiovascular, especially the myocardial infarction, was 14-fold higher in early onset type 2 diabetes when compared to the usual onset type 2 diabetes. And of course, uh, these are the findings of that study. And we did a study in our institute. So we studied the younger uh, population. And the, we studied about 373 subjects. Microalbuminuria was present in 23.6% of the patients. So if you can have microalbuminuria detected early, definitely now by using uh, ACE inhibitors, ARB, and SGLT2 inhibitors, definitely we can retard the progression of renal damage. And then only 18.4% of the patients had their HbA1c less than 7%. And 55.5% of the patients had HbA1c more than 9%. Now, important thing is glycemic control. Glycemic control is very important. In addition to that, blood pressure control and use of proper drugs like uh, uh, probably now SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs can definitely retard the progression of renal damage in these young patients. And then we uh, recently, about a few months back, we had a post-MD fellowship candidate. We did a study, and it showed that prevalence of retinopathy was 21%, nephropathy 22 and neuropathy 22%, almost equal. So we can remember that 20 to 30% complications in young onset type 2 diabetes patients. Of course, this is one of the studies in Hong Kong. They said the hospitalizations is more in young onset type 2 diabetes when compared to the usual onset. And again, the psychosocial and emotional problems, as we see in our practice, it's definitely more. When an young patient develops diabetes, he comes directly with depression. Why I have developed diabetes at this early age? What, uh, what is my future? All those things, definitely he will be under severe stress. So the high level of diabetes distress, 24%, depression, 46%, stress also about 41%. Whether remission is possible in young. Now it's, as I said, a patient comes to me with HbA1c 10, 11%, sir, I want to reverse my diabetes. I don't want to take any medicine. This, uh, when he comes, first of all, most of our patients, they don't want to take any medicine. And now, because of this reversal business, they come and ask us that we don't want to take uh, medicine. 10 and 11 percent HbA1c, if we don't give medicine, and if this level of HbA1c stays for about six months to one year, he develop all complications. I have seen one of my patients who is the brother of a doctor. He has not taken medicine for 10 years. Now he comes with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and CKD stage 4. So what to do for these patients? Again, uh, uh, reversal, reversal, reversal. I don't know when this will end. So if you see here, remission. In diabetics, we have severe insulin deficient. 
diabetes, insulin resistant obese diabetic, combined insulin resistant and deficient diabetes. These are the three clusters. Of course, mild age related we cannot take. When we take these three clusters, severe insulin deficient we cannot reverse or remit because severe insulin beta cell dysfunction we cannot reverse. And again, one more autoimmune also we cannot remit. But insulin resistant and combined insulin resistant, probably some percent of the patients may go in for remission, but that we have to see the individual patient and then decide. So that I think uh, it should go to the young minds. I don't know, many young doctors are outside. Um, so uh, I don't know whether my message will reach them or not. Whether antibody tests to be done in all young diabetics. So again here, some of uh, doctors say, sir, antibodies, GAD antibodies are too costly, all those things. I don't think you require to do antibodies in all our patients. It is mostly for, uh, if you take type 1 diabetes, it, is, it will differentiate whether it is an anti -pos antibody positive type 1 or antibody negative type 1 and the research purpose. So you can see the list of cases, type 1A diabetes, fasting C-peptide was very low. With that only we can decide that it is type 1. And in addition, GAD antibodies positivity says that it is type 1A diabetes. And again, 20% of them can have what is known as type 1B or idiopathic. Here also fasting C-peptide is low, but the antibodies, GAD antibodies were negative. So type 1 diabetes, Almost 80% will have antibody positive, but 20% can have antibody negativity also. When it comes to the in-between what is known as the LADA, that is, uh, we call it as type one and a half diabetes, that also we can diagnose by doing antibody levels. Here to clinically suspect, we should have what is known as the LADA clinical risk score. That is age of onset less than 50 years, presence of acute symptoms of hyperglycemia, BMI less than 25, and personal or family history of autoimmune disease. Either two criteria, more than two criteria if present, then we can subject them for antibodies. If it is positive, we can take it as LADA. So actually we did a study in our institute. So 17 of our patients were positive for uh, antibodies, and all patients had more than two clinical criteria of LADA clinical risk score. And of course, this is the Immunology Diabetes Society, which has given three specific criteria for diagnosis of LADA. <clears throat> that is age greater than 30 years, positive autoantibodies to islet beta cells, insulin independence for at least initial six months after diagnosis. And uh, one more study, this is actually a RGHS funded study because it's very difficult to do antibodies for 381 patients. They have funded this study. Out of 381 patients, only 29 of the patients were positive for GAD or IA2. Out of which, only six were positive for IA2, 22 were positive for GAD antibodies. That means if you do GAD antibodies in practice, that is more than enough. But doing IA2 antibodies is just for research purposes. And actually, I, we compared this with uh, several international studies. The famous UKPDS study, which said that 11.6% were antibody positive. Botnia study, 9.3% antibody positive. Another Norway study, 10%. Action LADA Europe study, 97 They were all European studies. Usually Europeans have more antibodies because they develop type 1 diabetes. The percentage is more there. And then if you see the Japan, China, UAE, Korea, they all have three to five percentage of antibodies. And of course, our study showed about 7.61 percentage of antibody positivity. So how to manage diabetes in young? Again, while managing diabetes in young, we have to divide between less than 18 years and more than 18 years. If it is less than 18 years, you can use only metformin and insulin. More than 18 years, metformin, DPP-4, sulfonylurea, SGLT2, and insulin can be used. Uh, recently, if you all know, US FDA has approved empagliflozin in, in children more than 10 years for usage, but we have to use very carefully in young patients. And this is the algorithm for, by ADA. If the HbA1c is less than 8.5%, we can use metformin is sufficient. If it is more than 8.5%, we can use metformin and insulin, probably basal insulin or basal bolus, and of, of course, acute situations by low dose insulin infusion. And insulin requirement is quite high in 
type 2 diabetes in youth, about almost 52% of the patients require insulin. What are the rare types of diabetes in young? I think uh, even these rare types, we have to remember, it is quite rare, but as a precision medicine when you practice, we have to remember rare cases also. What, what is monogenic diabetes? Monogenic diabetes, either we could have a neonatal diabetes uh, or maturity onset diabetes in Eng, Modi. And Modi actually in 1975 itself, Tattersall and Fagens had made this criteria. And even now it is applic applicable, we can use this criteria that is early onset of type two, early onset of diabetes less than 25 years and early onset of diabetes in at least two or three successive family members, autosomal dominant mode of inheritance, non-insulin dependence, absence of ketosis and beta cell autoimmunity, usually no obesity or insulin resistance. These factors we can use for diagnosis of MODI. And the US search for diabetes in youth study reported that most MODI cases were misclassified as either type one or type two diabetes. Of course, this is because of lack of knowledge, and if they don't do genetic analysis, definitely they misclassify. And again, in MODI, they have to remember four MODIs that is enough. That is MODI-3, HNF-1-alpha, glucokinase MODI-2, and then HNF-4-alpha, MODI-1, and HNF-1-beta, MODI-5. If they remember these four, I think, uh, uh, for clinical diagnosis, it's more than sufficient because they account for more than 90% of MODI cases. And we have more up to 14 MODIs, but if you remember four and others, you can refer literature whenever you get a result of genetic analysis. So again, just to note, MODI-3 is responsive to sulfonylurea. That is very important because if you are using insulin, you can change it to sulfonylureas. And glucokinase, glucokinase usually they do not come to the doctor because they have, have mild persistent fasting hyperglycemia that you know, does not need any treatment, they may not come to you. And HNF4-alpha, that is MODI1, again response to sulfonylurea is good, but they have reduced HDL levels, they behave almost like type 2 diabetes. And of course, modify HNF1 beta. Here, important thing is they are associated with renal cysts, dysplasia, and renal tract malformations, and they are known as renal cysts and diabetes syndrome. And usually, they respond to insulin, they don't respond to OHS. And one more flat bush diabetes. This is also one of the rarer diabetes, ketosis prone diabetes. Actually, this was uh, diagnosed first in a place called flat bush in um, US. Usually they present with very high blood glucose levels, very high de uh, with uh, varying degrees of ketosis, and they respond very well to insulin, and afterwards we have to taper, and then maybe probably you have to stop the insulin, and they respond well to diet and OHS afterwards. And one of the important studies, they have studied 103 ketosis-prone diabetic patients, and they have classified them into four groups. I think you all know about this, A minus beta plus, depending upon the antibody positivity and then the uh, beta cell functional reserve. This A minus beta plus 50%, A plus beta minus 17%, A minus beta minus 22%, A plus beta plus 11%. So the important thing to diagnose this KPD is no precipitating factor for diabetic ketoacidosis. There won't be any precipitating factor like infection. For type 1, you have infection. Here, there won't be any precipitating factor. Early recovery of insulin secretion following treatment with insulin. Insulin dosage reduces progressively. And typically, these subtypes may go in for remission. Again, remission here, uh, babas may come into, uh, they may say we have cured diabetes. And lot of ketosis prone diabetes have been reported across the world. I think Swaraj is sitting in front of me. So he has published one study with six ketosis prone diabetes from Gulbarga. And again, one more study, Gupta et al. He has also published about 11 ketosis prone diabetes. I think we should, many of us see such patients, probably we would not have published. So maybe with a multi-center approach, we can publish studies, ketosis prone diabetes in uh, of course, in future, because if you don't publish, it will, 
because he has published, I think I can just uh, uh, see these cases. And then FCPD. FCPD, we all know the criteria it should come for, uh, the patient should be from a tropical country, diabetes should be present, evidence of chronic pancreatitis or calculi, and absence of other causes of chronic pancreatitis, and the most dread dreaded complication is pancreatic carcinoma. And uh, this is the x-ray of an FCPD patient with calculi, and usually 80% of them require insulin, and others they will manage, can be managed with diet and OHS. Once diagnosis is made, is there a possibility to change the diagnosis during follow-up in subsequent years? This is true. Actually, this study by Sahu et al., 23% of the patients' diagnosis have been changed after one year because they have diagnosed initially as type 1 diabetes, and after subsequently when they did uh, uh, C-peptide and other tests, they could change the diagnosis because of the clinical features and uh, investigations. What, what is the flow chart for diagnosis of diabetes in Eng? Here, the precision medicine, evidence-based medicine, everything we, should, we have to use here. Now, diabetes in Eng, you should see, take family history. If family history is positive, again, go see, if it is positive in three generations, Modi. If it is positive only in father or mother, it, can, it is early onset type 2 diabetes. Family history is negative, ketonuria positive, and very low C-peptide, it is type 1 diabetes. And family history negative, ketonuria negative, and pancreatic calculi, it is FCPD. It's very easy. If you have an algorithm like this, if you are sitting in a clinic, in your uh, diabetic clinic, and if you see the algorithm, you should know all these things and then uh, uh, decide about the diagnosis. Because blindly, we cannot treat them as type 1 diabetes. Now coming back to the four cases what I discussed initially, so this patient, age 22 years, treated as type 1 diabetes almost for one, one and a half years, with HbA1c 11%, 12%, not coming down. Family HD was positive. Both parents were positive. BMI is 28.57. Probably it was missed. So she was on this regular uh, insulin and premix. So we did C-peptide, fasting C-peptide, 2.37. So without doubt, we can say it is type 2 diabetes. So then metformin was added, and subsequently even glimepiride. We could get the HbA1c to 6.8%, and of course, insulin was tapered, but low dose, we have to continue. So this is actually proper diagnosis was not made. If we had left this patient like that, all lifelong she would have been on insulin without proper control of HbA1c. Of course, this is the reports. And then this patient, again, very interesting, a male 15 years old, diagnosed as type 1, BMI was 15, but family history was again positive. Father was diabetic. And initially when we did C-peptide, actually when the HbA1c was very high, we are not supposed to do C-peptide. But see, when we do C-peptide, if it is very low, even with higher HbA1c, we will get the low C-peptide levels. So initially we did, it was 1.81. And of course, uh, a basal bolus, aspart, and traceba was used. After one month, its control was very good, 92 FPG, PPG 119. But C-peptide was done because of the glucotoxicity being out. C-peptide was 4.75, stimulated was 5.08, so definitely type 2. It cannot be type 1. Type 1 cannot have such very good C-peptide levels. So again, this patient was treated as type 2. Now he is not on drugs. Glimepiride was given. Now everything was stopped. So all two type 1 became type 2. Now this patient, very interesting, 20 years old, but family history, father had uh, diabetes, father's mother had diabetes, then successive generations having uh, early onset type 2 diabetes, we have to think of Modi. And BMI was very, very less, 19.49. C-peptide was almost normal. So when the C-peptide normal with family history positive in successive generations, we have to think of Modi. And this was sent for Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Center for Genetic Analysis, where we got the result as ABCC8 gene heterozygous mutation, Modi 12, again responsive to sulfonylurea. So his insulin was gradually tapered and stopped, and glimepiride was given. Uh, of course, 0.5 mg to start with. With 0.5 mg only, he got very good control from HbA1c. 11 or 12 percent, it came to 6.4 percent. So this, again, type 1 has become Modi. And finally, this patient, 27 years, female, family history negative, BMI was 20. 
And this patient's fasting C-peptide was 0 0.010. It was negligible. So 100% type 1 diabetes. We cannot say anything. It is like uh, uh, proof, proof, uh, proof diagnosis that fasting C-peptide, when it is very low, we have to take it as type 1 diabetes. And of course, uh, some uh, statistics, 3,370 patients were uh, screened in our uh, center. Type 2 diabetes was 72%, type 1, 25%, LADA, 0.9, MODI 1, FCPD 1. What we have to remember is FCPD, LADA, MODI, only 1%. But in practice, we should remember, when you practice diabetology, you can't say that I don't know about MODI, LADA, or FCPD. Of course, the take-home message, type 2 diabetes in young is raising. Differential diagnosis is wide. And remember that early onset type 2 diabetes is quite aggressive. We have to treat them and to prevent complications, not to reverse diabetes. Just reversing diabetes is not our criteria. Preventing complication, I think uh, uh, in the discussion of the debate, it was there. We, uh, we have to prevent complications. That's more important. Unfortunately, the diagnosis of diabetes in young is often delayed because they do not come to the doctors and uh, doctors also have some negli uh, negligence or whatever. If they don't have uh, knowledge, they may not uh, give much interest and treat these patients. And timely and accurate diagnosis combined with regular follow-up is very important to maintain their glycemic control to prevent complications. And finally, diabetes in young is under-screened, under-supported, under-treated, and under-reported also. So long live KRSSTI, thank you. And maybe I think I have to just show the KER uh, uh, blue lighting on World Diabetes Day. This is, uh, this is the institute where we have done all the uh, studies. And of course, KER, KRSSTI, both have K in common. And we have KR Narsim Sethi. We have to remember him because for both, he was the founder without probably if he had not founded this institute or even KRSSTI, all these uh, conferences and uh, uh, treatment for diabetic patients would not have been there. I, I don't know, probably we are missing him because we lost him maybe one, one and a half years back. We are missing him, so we have to remember him. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again for this opportunity.